I speak to a tremendous range of different organizations. I speak to corporate groups, I speak to associations, uh, I speak to professional organizations. Regardless of whom I'm speaking to, I start every single presentation with three trends, three statistics, three observations, which put in perspective the speed of change in our world today. Now, I was preparing some years ago for an education conference for Australia, and I dug out this Australian research study which looked at the future of careers, looked at the future of jobs, looked at the future of education. And buried away in this report was this statistic, and you might have heard this statistic because it has become a bit of an internet meme. Buried away was this suggestion that 65% of children, seven out of 10 children who are in preschool today will work in a job or career that does not yet exist. Think about that, a child who is five or six years old today, there is a likelihood seven out of 10 of those children will work in a job or career. We don't even yet know what that job or career is because things are changing so quickly. And that's a very good indication of the speed of change in which we find ourselves immersed today. Second observation comes from a study of science education in North America, where they were looking at the rapid evolution of science, how quickly science is evolving. And it suggested if anybody today is taking any type of degree that is based on science, so agriculture, architecture, engineering, anything having to do with technology, anything healthcare related, it is estimated that new knowledge is emerging so quickly that half of what we learn in our very first year of a college or a university program, half of that knowledge is obsolete or revised by the time we graduate four years later. We live in an era in which we are witnessing instant knowledge obsolescence. We live in an era in which just-in-time knowledge, getting the right knowledge at the right time for the right purpose, is increasingly becoming the most important skill that we can have as we go into this fast-paced future. The third observation comes from the world of technology. We know that technology is the driver of so much change. And I was with a digital camera company in Tokyo last October, and I was talking about how quickly technology is changing. And I was speaking with a, with a digital camera CEO, and he indicated when they bring the typical digital camera to market, this is back five years ago, and we actually used to buy digital cameras. You notice we don't even buy cameras anymore if we're not a professional photographer because we're taking our pictures on our iPhones and our Android devices. But he indicated when they bring the typical digital camera to market, they figure they've got about three to six months to sell it before it's obsolete. We, we live in a period of time in which products are you know, coming into our life and they're becoming obsolete before we can barely use them. And that's why my favorite phrase comes from the global media magnet Rupert Murdoch, who observed years ago, if you think about what is happening, if you think about the speed of change, if you think about all of these trends which are encompassing us, increasingly the most important issue going forward, you know, we can't succeed based on what we've done in the past. Our success comes from our speed. Our success comes from our ability to ingest fast-paced change. And my phrase has become this, the future belongs to those who are fast. It is your ability to ingest all of these fast-paced trends and turn them into opportunity that will define your success. And to, so too it is with the world of government. You know, the role of government is being challenged. The opportunity for government is being challenged. What we can do for a society in terms of taking a society forward is being challenged, and it's our ability to ingest the speed of change, which will help to define the role of government. And that's why an event like this is so critical, because this is an immersion of ideas. This is an opportunity to ingest new knowledge as to how we can accelerate our role as government organizations. Now, I've had the very great pleasure over a 25-year career of speaking to some of the most fascinating organizations in the world about the future, about trends. You know, the Walt Disney Organization has had me in. You know, Johnson & Johnson, pharmaceutical organizations, Lockheed Martin, aerospace companies. 
All of these organizations are struggling with the issue of speed. What do we do in a world in which there are so many trends coming at us from so many different perspectives? How do we innovate in the context of speed? And every once in a while, you get a phone call from a potential client, which is absolutely fascinating. About five years ago, I'm in my home office on Monday morning, the phone rings, and it's NASA on the phone. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is on the phone, and they found me. They said, Jim, you know, we've, we've watched some of your YouTube videos. We've read some of your material on innovation. We're kind of intrigued by your role as a futurist. We would like you to come in. We're having a meeting of our senior leadership. We would like you to come in and talk to us about the future of space. This was kind of an unusual request. And I said to them, well, who's going to be in the room? They said, well, we're going to have some astronauts. We're going to have some mission controllers. We're going to have people who are building the replacement for the Hubble telescope. We're going to have some launch directors. We're going to have some astrophysicists, people who are studying the origins of the universe and, and matter billions of light years from Earth. But we would like you to come in and talk to us about the future of space. And I said, OK, I can do that. So it's about a week before I'm getting my PowerPoint presentation together. And I'm starting to think to myself, I might be you know, taking on a little bit too much. I mean, these are incredibly intelligent people. How often do you get to, you know, the chance to talk to a bunch of astrophysicists? So I'm thinking to myself, where can I possibly start? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, the future, space, George Jetson. Now, when I was growing up in North America, and I was a small child, we had a TV show called The Jetsons. And The Jetsons was a TV cartoon that appeared in the year 1962. It, its goal was to show what the world would look like in the year 2062, 100 years later. It was a futuristic prediction. It was a prediction of where we would find ourselves one day in the future. So I started talking to NASA about The Jetsons. Well, why would I do this? Because if you watch this show today, if you go back and watch this cartoon, which appeared in 1962, and you look at what was happening. Back then, they predicted Skype. George was actually using FaceTime to talk to his boss. George was getting his news off an iPad-like device. There were Amazon Echo devices throughout the home. They actually had an Apple Watch in the Jetsons, and they predicted this in 1962. And it wasn't supposed to be here until the year 2062. And my point for NASA was this. Maybe the very first thing that we need to think about when it comes to the future is to appreciate it's probably going to happen faster than we think. Because we live in the era of acceleration. We live in a period of time in which everything is speeding up. And what we thought was far away, what we thought was science fiction in the distant future, is actually becoming a part of our life today. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is a good introduction. I'll have a little bit of fun with the astronauts, a little bit of humor. And then I started thinking to myself, how many times in my life am I actually going to get invited to speak to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and have a room full of astronauts? I'm thinking to myself, look, I, there is no way that I'm going into NASA and not talking about Spock. I've got to talk about Spock. I've got to put up a picture of Spock. We all know Star Trek. We all know this TV show from the 23rd century. The 23rd century. We watch Star Trek, and there's all this futuristic stuff. Well, the fascinating thing about Star Trek is this. If you watch that show, you realize some of the stuff that they're talking about from the 23rd century is, is appearing in our life today. You know, at, at this conference, we're talking about the grand challenges of our time. How do we, how do we utilize gov government to solve some of the biggest problems of our time having to do with education, healthcare, the environment, energy, the youth? How do we use government as a tool to take our societies forward? And we actually live in a period of time of the Global X Prize Foundation Challenge. The Global X Prize is an initiative challenging the global scientific community to solve some of the biggest problems of our time, having to do with education, environment, healthcare, the environment. And Qualcomm, which manufactures a lot of the computer chips we find in our cell phones or smartphones, 
actually put together a $10 million prize under the XPRIZE Foundation umbrella, saying, look, if you can develop a medical tricorder, if you can develop that device that we saw in Star Trek, if you can develop the device in that episode, which was a little device that Spock could hold next to the head of a human or an alien and get a readout of their health, we will award you a $10 million prize. If you can develop a device that somebody can hold to their head and in an instant get 13 physiological healthcare measurements, we'll award you the prize. And the reason I brought this up for NASA was during my conversations with the leadership team, I became aware that they did not know that out at NASA's Ames Research Laboratory in California, a group of 45 NASA scientists got together to try to win the prize. They went out on an informal, unsanctioned project and they raised the money on Kickstarter, a crowdfunding campaign site, to develop what they call the Sanadu Scout, the medical tricorder of the 23rd century, which I hold in my hands here right now. I can turn this little device on. This will Bluetooth tether to my phone. And this will, in an instant, take my blood pressure. It will take my pulse. It will take my oxygen level. This will actually run an EKG of my heart. They didn't actually win the prize. Another organization won the prize because the device could do glucose blood sugar testing. The point of this is this was not supposed to be here until the 23rd century. And it is here today. We, we live in an era in which the stuff that we thought was science fiction is all of a sudden becoming a part of our world today. We live in the era of acceleration. You know, Bill Gates once made an observation. You know, people tend to overestimate how much change will occur on a two-year basis. They underestimate how much change will occur on a 10-year basis. Do we think the world in 2018 is going to look anything, 2028 is going to look anything like it does today? It will not. Because we are going to witness more change in the next 10 years than we have even seen in the last 100. And the driver for that change is the acceleration of a whole series of trends, all of which are coming together all at once. You know, every morning I get up, and with my morning coffee, before I read my email, I take a photo somewhere where I've been on a stage somewhere in the world, and I write a little motivational quote around it, a little futuristic quote, and I put it out to my social media channels. I put it out to Instagram, I put it out to Twitter, I put it out to Facebook, and I share it with 50,000 people. And one morning I got up and this is the thought that came to my mind. We now live in a period of time in which companies that do not yet exist will build products not yet conceived, utilizing materials not yet in existence with manufacturing methodologies that we have barely even dreamt about. Are you ready for the world of disruption? Are you ready for a world in which the inconceivable is suddenly going to become a part of our life? And that's the reality that we find ourselves in. What are the trends that are defining this? How do we get there? What are the trends shaping our future? Now, I could sit here and give you a whole bunch of, you know, fascinating predictions of, you know, very science fiction-like stuff that we might see in the future. I think it's more important that we spend time to understand what are the trends taking us into a world in which the future belongs to those who are fast. Number one, I think we live in an absolutely transformative period of time. I think we live in a period of time in the year 2018 in which so many trends are coming together all at once that people are looking at these trends and they are accelerating their creativity and they are turning their imagination and innovation engines on. Think about the phrases that we are talking about these days. 3D printing, augmented reality, virtual reality, the internet of things, self-driving cars, drone technology, smart dust, vertical farms. All of a sudden there's a whole bunch of technologies coming together all at once. And people are realizing there are op opportunities to do magical things. Think about how quickly self-driving cars have become a reality. Think about the fact that, you know, I was in Mercedes-Benz a couple of months ago talking about the fact that, you know, their entire line of business is going to shift 
because self-driving cars are going to become a part of our life, because all of these technologies are coming together all at once. I was uh, speaking at an event in Phoenix, Arizona. And before I went on stage, the CEO of the American Trucking Association was on stage before me, talking to a whole bunch of trucking executives. And he said that I thought that self-driving trucks were 25 years away. I now believe that they are five years away or less. Because we're the, having the arrival of so many technologies and computing power and concepts and technology that are helping us to accelerate the development of this very sophisticated capability. I go into the energy sector and we are witnessing such an acceleration of technologies with renewables, with solar, with wind, with hydro that we are achieving what we call grid parity faster. The ability to generate a unit of energy at less cost than carbon, traditional oil. I was speaking at an event in Texas and a senior executive for an oil company was on stage before me and he said that he thinks he, we have one last oil boom ahead of us. Because by that point, renewables, wind, energy, solar, all of the things that we are doing with sophisticated battery technologies will eclipse this traditional industry. We live in an era in which there are so many trends coming together, this is accelerating the pace of change. And you can't help but witness the trends occurring in Dubai, where we have realized that what we can do is we can actually take existing drone technology and scale it up and make it bigger and stick a human in it. And there's our flying car from a television show like the Jetsons becoming a part of our life before we know it. We live in a transformative period of time. And I think we're going to wake up 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now and go, wow, it all began in the year 2017 and 2018 where it all came together and it helped people to turn on their imagination machines. At the root of all this is science. We live in a period of time in which science, which is behind everything, science is exponentiating. What is, what, is, what is happening here is we are in a situation when it comes to medical knowledge, we are seeing the, the development of so many new medical procedures, pharmacogenetics, genetic medicine, the development of new methodologies, new forms of diagnosis, new connected medical device technologies. It is estimated the volume of medical knowledge, somebody who is working as a doctor or a nurse or a physiotherapist, the volume of knowledge that they need to know is doubling every eight years because of new discoveries. Uh, we, we are in a situation in which we are witnessing what I call the, the math of hyper-science. I was in with BASF talking about the future of science, talking about the future of, of, of what is happening in the energy sector. And I ended up writing a blog post about Aramco. Why is Aramco positioning itself as a petrochemicals organization, moving away from traditional oil? They're following the path of hyperscience. You know what it said back today? We, we know of about 19 million chemical substances. There are 19 million known chemical substances. That number is now doubling every 13 years because we are discovering all kinds of new chemical substances. There will be 80 million by the year 2025. There will be 5 billion new chemical substances by the year 2100. What is the impact of this? Well, do you know when the original Apple iPod came out? Do you know the reason why Apple was able to miniaturize the hard drive to fit within that original Apple iPod? It was the discovery of one single new chemical substance which permitted them to miniaturize the hard drive. One single new chemical substance of five billion substances resulted in the emergence of a multi-billion dollar market in as short a period of time as five years. Hyper-science is changing everything. You can look anywhere and you can see the trends of what is occurring. You can see the trends by which everything is changing at a furious pace. Think about electric vehicles. Think about what is happening with the rush to electric vehicle technology. When you spend time with Mercedes-Benz, you appreciate that they understand that the vehicle they will be selling 10 years from now will be unlike anything we sell today as we get this shift to electric. And what is driving this shift to electric is that the cost of battery technology 
is accelerating with the exponentiation of science. Now, it's kind of fascinating to think about what is happening with batteries. What's happening with batteries is we are figuring out how to make battery technology more powerful, last longer, become lighter. I read this fascinating article about a fellow who was talking about the use of battery technology in drones. Think about drones. What do we want to do with a drone? With a drone, we want it to fly longer, further, stay in the air longer. How do we do that? We do that by making the battery lighter. And some of us don't realize how much we are using drones for. Do you know we actually have Fitbits for cows? I was with 250 cattle ranchers talking about the future. And do you know we actually have collars that we can put around a herd? And we can fly a drone over the herd and get instant insight into the health of the animals on our ranch. Drone technology is having an impact everywhere. I talked to a lot of agricultural groups where we can fly a drone over a field of corn or a field of wheat and get an instant assessment of the health of the crop, the salinity of the, the soil, the moisture of the soil, where we are pulling out all kinds of information utilizing drone technology. And what this article about drone technology batteries said is that there are 13 alternatives to lithium-ion batteries which are leading us down this cost curve where they become lighter, less expensive, and can stay in the air longer. Some of you might remember we had this movie in North America called The Graduate, 1960s. And the older fellow is talking to the younger individual, and he said, I've got one word for you about the future. The word is plastics. The future is to be found in plastics. I've got one word for you when it comes to the future. The future is batteries. Because there is so much going on with battery science. The ability to re-engineer our energy systems, where we collect solar cell energy through the day. We store it in sophisticated battery technology so we can release it back into the grid at night, transforming the very essence of our energy business model. You know, we are in a situation in which there was a young Serbian who agreed to have his injured arm amputated to be replaced by a robotic prosthetic arm, which would give him more functionality because we have accelerated the science of medicine, the science of prosthetics, the science of robotic arms to such a degree. You know, we are in a situation in which I firmly believe that in as little as five or 10 years, 15, 20 years, we will be carrying around a battery pack that will carry the equivalent charge of the Hoover Dam as we continue on this quest with the acceleration and exponentiation of science to store more energy in smaller devices. Because we live in the era of acceleration. We live in an era in which the inconceivable is becoming conceivable. We live in an era in which scientists have figured out how to stop light in its tracks. Isn't that one of the fundamentals of science? that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And I spoke at this uh, conference of cable telecom engineers, telecom, telecommunication engineers, back in 2006. And I said, we live in an era in which we can stop light, and this is going to change everything. Because it will help us to develop more sophisticated routers. It will help us to do things with the internet which we cannot begin to dream about. They didn't take kindly to such a suggestion because the rule of physics is that light travels at 186,000 miles a second. And an editorial in an industry publication said, who invited that idiot Jim Carroll in to talk about the you know, conceived concept that light could be stopped? And then a couple of optical scientists wrote in and said, yes, we're doing exactly that. We have figured out at MIT University how to stop light in its tracks, and this changes everything. Think about what we are doing with the volumes of information which are being created. We are creating vast sums of information with big data, with analytics. The Internet of Things is leading us to this world in which every device is generating scandalous amounts of information. We are headed towards the world of the yottabit. Think about units of measurement. Megabits, terabits, gigabits, zettabits. You know what the biggest unit of measurement for data storage capacity is? Yottabits. Yottabits. One day we are going to be in the world of the Yottabit, which is, which is an inconceivable volume of information 
I think I was kind of smart about this because I bought yottabits.com 20 years ago and I still own it. And when we get to this world of massive data capacities, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. We are in a world in which we are witnessing the acceleration of capabilities in terms of how much information we can send through the net networks that we are building. You know, we have a technology at the heart of what we call optical fibers, something called dense wave division multiplexing. It's the technical term that means what we are essentially doing through an optical fiber is we can send through multiple bandwidths of light, multiple colors of light through the single fiber. And because there are an infinite number of colors in the spectrum, Theoretically, through an optical fiber, we can send an infinite volume of information, which is going to take us to the world of the audit. But what happens in a world in which we can send and receive unbelievable volumes of information and we can stop light in its tracks? What happens in a world in which we could perhaps have the capability that as we stop that light in its tracks, and we bring ourselves the Yadabit cube, and we capture in this cube the whole of human knowledge that exists, and all of the human knowledge which is yet to come, because we've captured light in this device, and we carry it around with us. Well, of what use is that? Well, we are witnessing significant advances today in what we call human computer interfaces. The ability to link our brains to outside devices to augment our knowledge. And we are in a period of time in which I think we're going to wake up 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, and realize what we have witnessed is an extension of the human mind. You know, if you go back through our history on the planet, you know, in the very early day of the humanoid experience, we had brains that were 600 square, square cubic centimeters of capacity. And then we invented fire, and we invented other capabilities. We invented weapons. And during each of these technological revolutions in our lifetime, the capacity of our brain increased. Where today, we've got a capacity of about 1,200 cubic centimeters. And I think what is going to happen is we master this ability for human-computer interaction, and we develop the Yadabit cube. We are going to witness the expansion of our brain capacity through the information we have at our disposal, where we will be carrying around this cube with the whole of human knowledge. Part of what is happening here in every single industry is that we are witnessing the emergence of new careers. We're witnessing the emergence of individuals who are going to help us to augment our reality. What we might call neuroscience enhancement engineers who are taking us to this world of complex human machine interaction. Part of the trend which is unfolding here is every single industry is becoming a software industry. Think about what happens with the Internet of Things. Think about what happens in a world in which every device which is part of our daily life becomes plugged into the Internet. You know, I was speaking at a uh, healthcare conference in the United States a couple of months ago. I said, look, this could get weird. It could get out of hand. You know, maybe one morning I'll get up, I'll get on my weigh scale. It's going to send an email to my fridge, you know, don't let Jim in today. He's not living up to the terms of his diet. And it's going to contact my insurance company and cut off my coverage. But it is fascinating to think about what happens to industries as this hyper-connectivity unfolds. Think about what is happening in the world of automotive insurance. Think about what happens when we put a GPS device in a car and we can now underwrite your insurance policy based upon your real-time driving behavior. Are you stopping at all the stop signs? Are you showing good driving behavior? Are you speeding too much? If you're showing good driving behavior, We'll give you a rebate on your insurance. And all of a sudden, what happens here is the insurance company has become a technology company. Think about what happens with the concept of healthcare when we have a medical tricorder. All of a sudden, the world of healthcare has become a software driven industry. And we know that the world of software and technology operates at the speed of Moore's Law. It's happening in the world of agriculture. Did you know the typical acre of corn, the typical acre of wheat, is giving off five gigabytes of data per year because the agricultural industry is becoming a tech industry because we can fly a drone or we can fly a satellite or we can embed technology in plants 
that report on health, soil moisture, humidity, call for intelligent watering centers. There was just an article in the Dubai paper yesterday talking about the fact that we have now developed microchips which will become a part of a plant. If you go through the uh, facility out here, one of the shows, you'll see there's a Danish individual and she's actually got a microchip implanted in her hand. We're gonna have the same thing for the uh, plants that we're growing on the farm. Because agriculture is becoming a technology industry, think about what happens with self-driving trucks. Audi actually has a prototype vehicle which does not have windows. And the vehicle can actually be driven by someone from thousands of miles away using virtual reality and other technologies. The world of trucking has become a technology industry. I was speaking at a uh, conference days before I came over here in Toronto, Canada. And I was talking about the fact that Amazon has actually taken out a patent because Amazon sees that its role in the era of intelligent connected highways is to become the organization that might sell you high priority lane access and do intelligent traffic routing and do all the things that Amazon does to disrupt an industry. Amazon could very well be defining the future of the hyper-connected highway. You know, we think about what is happening in terms of the cost of doing things. You look at self-driving cars, what's happening? Well, self-driving cars, we have a little technology that we call LiDAR very localized form of radar. If you've seen the Uber self-driving cars, they have a little spinning thing on the top. And that is the technology which gives the vehicle the vision to understand where is the road, where are the pedestrians, where do I stop? It provides the vehicle the vision to understand how to become a self-driving vehicle. The cost for LiDAR is collapsing. The cost for LiDAR is following the law of Moore's law, that the processing power of a computer chip doubles every 18 months, and the cost cuts in half. LiDAR is going from $70,000 to $250 to $90 to a dollar or a couple of cents. The cost to develop the technology for these self-driving vehicles is absolutely collapsing. It's happening with human genomics. Anybody have their 23andMe DNA test done? I had mine done. The good news is I do not carry the gene which puts me at risk for Alzheimer's. I do not carry the genetics which puts me at risk for multiple sclerosis or cystic fibrosis or other tragic diseases. Now, when you do this test, you find all kinds of other fascinating information. I found out that I carry the gene which is common to most high-speed sprinters, Olympic runners. They carry the same genetic DNA as I do. Like, look at me. And, you know, every time Usain Bolt was on TV during the Olympics, I'd be kind of, you know, hi, cousin, how are you? But think about where gen genomic medicine takes us. Genomic medicine has taken us to a world in which increasingly we know what people will become sick with. And we can re-architect the delivery of healthcare based upon that knowledge. It takes us to a world that we call pharmacogenetics. The ability to generate and come up with a pharmaceutical that fits a segment of 60,000 people in the population who carry a particular genetic trait. The reality is the cost for genomic sequencing is collapsing. It cost $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. By 2009, it was down to $100,000. Five years ago, it was $10,000. Last year, it was $1,000. Next year, it's going to be a dollar or two. The cost to do genomics the cost to take us into this world in which we understand what people are going to become sick with and what they are at risk for will help us as government to con continually and completely transform the concept of the delivery of healthcare. The cost of electric vehicle technology is following the same cost curve as Moore's Law because of the acceleration of battery science. This is occurring in every single industry. And the question for us is, how do we align our role, our goal, our activities as government organizations to take advantage of these trends? We are in a world in which increasingly small organizations are defining the future of big organizations. Think about the process we have to do if we're a retailer and we want to accept credit cards in our store. We want to accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover. We have to go through a very difficult process to prove our credit worthiness to a bank. And along comes a small little company in San Francisco, which develops a tiny little device that we plug 
into the microphone jack of our iPhone, and we can swipe our credit card through it and take a payment from a customer, and a few days later, the money shows up in our account. And all of a sudden, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express realize that a small company in San Francisco has completely redefined their future. We are in a world in which so much of the, the evolution of technology with drone technology is happening with startups, small organizations using crowdfunding campaigns, small organizations taking advantage of the fact that increasingly we are in a world in which small beats big. We're witnessing the, this in the world of vehicle production. You know, one of the most fascinating trends occurring out there is the Elio device, which is a small motorcycle-like device with self-driving capabilities. And they're going out and they're raising the funds on Kickstarter and crowdfunding campaigns to develop their version of the car of the future. You know, we are in a situation when I'm in with Mercedes-Benz, we're talking about the fact that, you know, an electric vehicle is so much more simple to build than a carbon oil-based vehicle that utilizes gasoline. Because we have a generator, we have a battery, we have some wheels, and if you look at a Tesla, an iPad-like device which defines everything that the car is. Do you know what this does in every single industry? It accelerates and challenges us in terms of the skills that people need to know to do their job. Do you know the typical truck today carrying freight has more technology in the cabin of the truck than this typical Cessna jet? We are putting more technology into a truck than we have in a jet. We are, we are in a world in which the knowledge that people need to know to do their job is increasing at an absolutely furious pace. I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil two years ago speaking at the World Skills Conference. And this is a global conference of government leaders and education officials focused on how do we transition young people into the economy of the future and what skills and knowledge challenges exist. And I'm going to be speaking on Tuesday morning to the Ministry of Education to a series of teachers and principals and others from Dubai. But what do we do with our children today to transition them into a world in which much of the knowledge that they are getting today might become obsolete by the year of tomorrow? You know, we, we uh, in our home in Toronto, we got one of the first internet-enabled thermostats in our home. You know, it's, it's, it's these devices that you can go on your iPhone and you can turn your air conditioning up and down. It helps us to become more efficient in terms of our energy usage. And my heating, ventilation, air conditioning contractor fellow came in the house and he looked at the thermostat and, whoa, this is kind of difficult. He said, I can do the wiring that goes into your furnace and the air conditioner, but this has Ethernet stuff. This has Ethernet wiring. I don't know what to do with this stuff. And I said, that's okay. My 12-year-old will do the wiring, and he did. Think, think about what has happened to this poor fellow. He has a skilled trade. And all of a sudden, the knowledge the, he has necessary to do his job isn't there. We are in a situation in which the volume of knowledge that people need to know to take us into the future is changing. Mercedes-Benz is going to invest $10 billion dollars in the shift towards self-driving vehicles and electric vehicle technology. And they, like every single automotive company, is in a global race for skills because the new skills are technology, the new skills are energy, the new skills are batteries. It's not the traditional skills that they've had. And if you witness what is happening, all of the automotive companies are in a race for global skills where they are rushing to buy up and access the necessary skills to take themselves into the future. You know, I go out and I speak at a lot of conferences where I'm talking about future of careers and the fascinating new careers which are emerging in our world today. Predictive community, real-time healthcare dashboard managers. Because what we are developing in the world of, dashboard, uh, of healthcare is the ability to predict the emergence of healthcare conditions in real time. We are witnessing the emergence of vertical farming infrastructure managers. Think about what you're doing in Dubai. How do we build towers in which we can grow plants and feed the population? In Ghana, Afra, Africa, half of the food is grown inside the city. Cognitive home technology system integrators to develop seniors care facilities in our homes based on Internet of Things technology, smart highway routing concierges. We are witnessing the emergence of all kinds of new jobs and really esoteric skills. You know, one of the, one of the uh, automotive companies looking at the future of automotive, they realize, you know, all these self-driving cars, what they're really going to do is they're going to travel in packs and we have to teach our cars how to travel and talk to each other. And what animal 
is really good in traveling in packs and talking to each other as they route themselves across the Antarctic tundra, penguins. So this particular automotive company has gone out and has hired one of the world's leading experts on penguin behavior because they figure that is going to be the key to where they go with self-driving technology in the future. I just about five more minutes to close. We are in a world in which what is happening with all these trends is people who are thinking big and bold about where we can go in the future. People who are realizing we live in an absolutely transformative time. We live in a world in which we're talking about how can we grow solar cells from plants? How can we actually grow solar cells from plants? We can do that at MIT today. Think about Elon Musk. Think about his audacity to launch his Tesla Roadster into space and reinvent the automotive industry and reinvent the space industry and reinvent the battery industry because he is thinking big and bold. And there are more you know, Elon Musks out there. We, we have individuals who are talking about the fact, let's build 24-hour solar power plants. Well, the sun's only up 10 hours a day. Yes, but with accelerated battery technology, we can capture that energy. We can store it in batteries and release it into the grid at night. What are we doing in government to think big and bold? What are we doing in government to realize we live in an era of 3D microfish? that we can print in a healthcare facility that will swim through your body and report on a particular diagnosis because people are talking about this, people are doing this. How do we as government align ourselves to a fast-paced future? And I think the most magical thing about our period of time is we now have tremendous scale. We have connected three to four billion people around the world and we have the opportunity to share ideas and grab onto those ideas in ways that has never previously happened in human history. I found this great little chart. What, hap what would happen if solar use grew as fast as Facebook did? You know, on day one, we would have 12,000 homes plugged into the grid in 14 months, all of California. In 4.7 years, if solar grew in terms of adoption as quickly as Facebook grew, we would generate enough power on the planet to power the planet with solar in about 4.7 years. We have an opportunity for scale which has never existed. How do we get to this world? And that's what's so fascinating about being in Dubai because we are witnessing it right here. I'm a golfer, I love golf. I'm actually gonna sneak out for a round tomorrow up at Jumarai. And you know, there's a fascinating picture from the Emirates Open which is held here every year and I tried to find the picture, I couldn't find it, but they showed the fellow in the first tee in 1996, and he's teeing off, and there is absolutely nothing in the background. And but 20 years later, the reality of what has occurred here. We live in an era of scale. We live in an era in which the quote found here is not science fiction, it is fact. And my message for you as you go forward in the world of government is to align yourself to these trends. Change your future before it changes you and recognize it's gonna happen faster than you think. You know, look, you look in the rear view mirror of your car, and it says objects in the mirror are closer than you think. The future is closer than you think. The future belongs to those who are fast. I will give you one overriding message which should define your future, and it is this. What you really need to do in terms of the future role of government is you need to think big, you need to start small, you need to scale fast. You need to be your own Elon Musk in terms of your role. You need to take on a tremendous number of projects to understand the scope of what is occurring here with all of these trends and many more trends. And you need to focus on scale. How do we become more agile? How do we become more flexible? How do we challenge the very organizational sclerosis that we find in so many government organizations to do the things that we need to do to align ourselves to a fast-paced future. Thank you very much. Enjoy your conference.